progressing to the finish. We're progressing to the finish. And I hope that you picked up that there's an intensification um, of grace at the moment. There's a great intensification of grace as we're moving forward in our purpose, in that which God has called us to do. Um, we are rising in zeal. And I pray that great zeal will come into your life. This is not a time for apathy. I hope you understand that. This is not a time for lukewarmness. This is a time for you to begin to rise in the purposes of God for your life. So welcome to all of you as you're gathering with your families and even your children. I need your children to sit there with you, to focus on the word, to listen to the word, to also grow in grace because the next generation is very important to us. I want to continue with our series. We've been speaking about the chosen generation, the chosen generation. And if you missed out the first session, you can go and um, watch it on our YouTube channel. And I pray that you are listening to these messages over and over again. After being in this meeting, you must listen to, get hold of the video, listen to this message over and over again, because there's some important things that I'm touching on here that are being debated worldwide now, as there is an intens uh, intensification of the true church, there is also an inten uh, intensification of the false church. You have to understand that the true and the false are growing together. But the Bible says that the house of David will become stronger and stronger while the house of Saul becomes weaker and weaker. So um, just a note, please keep your uh, microphones muted so it doesn't interfere with our video recording. Okay. And I pray that you will be blessed this morning. I want to turn your attention to our key scripture. Well, you don't have to turn there right now. This is our overall key scripture, 1 Peter 2 verse 9 and 10, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. We thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you that you speak to us through your word in Jesus' name. Well, I spoke to you about the first part, which is total depravity. A chosen generation understand that they are totally depraved, absolute inability Total depravity is the fallen state of human beings as a result of original sin. In this household, we believe in original sin. We believe that Adam, because of um, original sin, Adam was the progenitor of the human race. And as a result of the fall, we were not inclined to be able to love God wholly with our hearts, with our minds, and our strength, but we were rather inclined by nature to serve our own will and desire, and we rejected the rule of God. So we recognize in this household that we were totally depraved. We were totally uh, unable to come to God out of our own. Amen. So I hope that you um, are settled in that uh, first part that I've given you, that we were totally depraved. And in the last session, we discussed the evidence of total depravity. I don't have time now to recap that. But as I said, please go and listen to that again. I want to get to the second part now, which is unconditional election. Unconditional election. Now, we know that God is the potter and we are the clay. The potter chose a piece of clay from the earth with all of its imperfections, all of our imperfections. He chose us with all of us, all of our imperfections. And um, therefore, those imperfections, as I said, we were totally depraved. 
The clay was chosen. The clay didn't say, choose me, choose me. I want to be in on the pot. Well, I want to be part of the pot. The clay did not choose the potter. Hello? The clay did not choose the potter. The potter did not choose all the clay from the earth. He chose certain portions of clay at his own discretion. That is the main part that I want to bring out today. The last session was about imperfect clay. He chose the clay with all of its imperfection. Today, I want to speak to you about that he chose certain portions of clay at his own discretion and for his own pleasure. Only those who are chosen are fighting this doctrine. You know, that's a strange thing. A lot of people are fighting with us when they hear these things. Um, and not uh, it's not the unbeliever that's fighting about it. I've never seen an unbeliever saying, oh, why did God uh, uh, choose me? Or why didn't God choose me? Or they didn't fight about being not chosen. But those who are believers, those who are chosen, are fighting about being chosen. <laughs> So that's the great paradox. That's a great irony that we have at this point. Okay, let's get into it. What is election? What is election? Election is an act of God before creation in which he chooses some people to be saved and not on account of any foreseen merit in them but only because of his sovereign good pleasure. And this is uh, said by Wayne Grudem. Wayne Grudem was a great theologian. And he said, election is an act of God before creation in which he chooses some people to be saved. And it's not on account of any foreseen merit in them, but only because of his sovereign good pleasure. Now, remember Jesus said, 15. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. So you cannot choose Christ. You cannot choose him. You cannot choose to follow him. You cannot choose to uh, serve him. You cannot choose him by giving your heart to him. The fact that you're choosing him means that he first chose you. Amen. He first loved you. He first chose you. There's nothing that you could do to choose him. You may say, okay, now the Bible says, I put before you life and death. Choose life. No, no. He was speaking there to his people. You can only choose after you regenerated. Now when you become a son of God, now when you become a born again believer, every day you have death and life before you. Every day you have curses and blessings before you. Every day you have to choose. You have to choose to walk in that way which God has chosen you for. Okay, we'll speak about more of that later. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 13, but we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation. God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the spirit and believe in the truth. So now I want to get to our key texts. We've got, some, we've got two very important key text scriptures that I want to uh, process today, line upon line, precept upon precept. And I pray that you will focus on the word and that you will um, uh, discover these mysteries that we're speaking about today. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, we'll be reading from verse 4. Mm -hmm. Ephesians chapter 1 from verse 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. God chose certain individuals before the foundation of the world. This was before the beginning of any religious system. This was before the beginning of any churches. This was the beginning before any, um, any uh, domains that we see there in the world today. 
before the foundation of the world. And what did he do? Verse 4 says, he chose us in him. In him. You are chosen in him. The whole choice of God is reference to Christ in our union with him. He chose you in him to be in union with him. Christ is the head of this relationship. Okay, Christ is, Christ is the foundation of the spiritual house. Christ is the shepherd. We are the sheep. Christ is the vine. We are the branches. Christ is the high priest. We are the royal priest. You've got to understand this relationship with Christ. Okay, Christ is the bridegroom. We are the bride. And nothing happens without Christ. So even the choosing, you being chosen in him, it was because you were chosen in Christ. You are chosen in him. In him, you were circumcised. In him, you have redemption through his blood. In him, you live and move and have your being. In him, also, we have obtained an inheritance. In him, all things consist. In him dwells the fullness of the God in bodily. You are complete in him. These are all scriptures that I mentioned. Go and search all these scriptures that is it. It's called the in Christ or the in him scriptures. You are chosen in him. You're not chosen to be a member of a system. You're not chosen to be in a church, okay? You are set apart for a family, but that's not the main reason you're chosen. You are chosen in him. You were not chosen because you were in a church. You were not chosen because you were uh, in any system. You were chosen in him. That's where it starts. Here's the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. Everything comes, everything happens and consists in him. Now let's continue. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. You are chosen in him and then you are chosen to become holy and without blame. Now this is important, church. You were not chosen because you were holy. Let me say it again. You were not chosen because you were holy. Let's get this doctrine right because there are a lot of churches out there preaching a false gospel. No amount of holiness will save you. You were chosen to become holy and without blame. We know that this is accomplished through the cross. We were not chosen to go to heaven. We were not chosen for a mansion. We were not chosen um, uh, for uh, the, the life year after. Okay. We were also not chosen to live in sin, but we were chosen to be holy and without blame. And the elect is holy and without blame. They are, they are a sanctified company. And therefore, the scripture says that we should be holy. We should be holy. He knows that you have two natures inside of you. And there is a battle inside of you. There's a fight inside of you. So therefore, you were called that you should be holy, that you separate yourself, that you Come out, the Bible says, come out from amongst them and separate yourself. And this is a progressive work. The work of holiness, the work of sanctification is progressive. It doesn't happen the day that you are born again. You don't wake up the next day and voila, now you have a perfect uh, spirit or a perfect uh, soul. Okay, uh, it's not like that. You have received the nature of Christ, but now you have to feed that nature and rule over the flesh. But you are called in him, chosen in him, and you are chosen that you should be holy and without blame. Let's move on, verse 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame, before him 
in love. You are chosen in love. You are chosen in love. Love was God's motive. Love is the source of election. You are chosen because he loves you. Uh, that's why the Bible says in Ephesians 2 that God is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Even though we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. Amen. Because by grace you have been saved and he raised us up together. He made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It's because of his great love with which he loved us. The Bible says in Romans 5, God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us because he chose you. Do you know what? Because he chose you, nothing can separate you from that love. It doesn't matter what you go through, all the perils you go through in your life. The Bible says that um, neither death nor life, neither angels nor principalities nor powers, nor things present or things to come, uh, nor height or death uh, or any created thing shall be able to separate you from this love. This is what you should be rejoicing about today. Don't fight this thing. It is because he loves you. He chose you because he loves you. And it doesn't matter what comes against you. You are chosen because of his love. Now, this is, this is very special. Let me share something, a great nugget of mystery with you today. Romans 8 says, Romans 8 verse 28. We know that all things work together for those uh, for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So now because he loves you, you love him. But listen to this. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of the son. And that predestination is election. That means you are chosen. But how did he choose you? He chose you in love. And yeah, the Bible calls it foreknew, foreknowledge. Now, let me share with you what foreknew means. What is foreknowledge? Because the word foreknow is derived from the Greek word proginesco, proginesco, okay? And it means to know. It means to perceive or to recognize beforehand to take into account or specially consider beforehand. It means to grant prior acknowledgement or recognition to someone, to foreknow. It means to foreapprove or to make a previous choice of. And that's why the Bible says we're a special people because he knew you even before you were born. He knew you even while you were in your mother's womb. So there's four and the other part of the word is no. Now get this. The word no is in the sense of Adam knowing his wife and she conceived. That is how uh, intimate the word no is. He knew his wife. And she conceived. So God has this love for you that you were conceived in him. You were chosen in him because he foreknew you. Amen. He pre-approved you before the foundations of the earth. You know, sometimes I get these messages on my bank. Uh, uh, it's very tempting, but I try not to give in to it, um, <laughs> that I am pre-approved for a certain loan, or I'm pre-approved to increase my overdraft. I'm sure you get these pre-approval messages, then you get excited. Oh, oh you know, the bank knew me. <laughs> the bank knows me. Now, in that way, God pre-approved you. He favors certain people. He pre-loved certain people i'm not talking about the dress you're trying to sell on facebook marketplace and you say that dress was pre-loved <laughs> okay i'm just checking if you're awake 
God pre-loved certain people. God decides whom he chooses to save. And this is his sovereignty. Don't tell me it's unfair. Okay, and don't tell me, oh, the Bible says, but God loves everyone. It doesn't say that. And we will get into that in the future. Don't um, uh, 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 let your mind run in all kinds of directions. Stay with me in terms of what I'm teaching you right now. This is his sovereign right. It is his sovereign right. Math, uh, sorry, Romans 9 verse 13 says, Jacob, I have loved, but Esau, have I hated? You may say, oh, but God can't hate. Hey, the Bible says, God says there, Jacob, I have loved. Esau, I have hated. Now, don't um, get sad for those who God doesn't love. Get excited that you are loved. Be grateful that you are loved. You are here today because you are are loved you are here today because you are chosen rest in that amen rest in that today so you are chosen in his love we we back at verse four now ephesians one verse four just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestined as to adoption as sons. That's the next point. Why are you chosen? You are chosen to be adopted. You are chosen to be adopted. God chose us to be part of his family. He chose us to receive the blessings of being part of his family. And that's why you are here today because God takes uh, people out of isolation and he puts them into families. Amen. God has even shifted you from a natural family into, from a biological family into a spiritual family. You are not chosen for membership. You are chosen for sonship because this family has to do with your purpose. Amen. And um, the Bible says, as many as received him, to them he gave the right, to them he gave the power, to him, to them he gave the privilege to become the sons of God. Now, let's continue. Uh, Ephesians 1, verse 4. You are predestined to the adoption of sons. So far we say you are chosen in him. You are chosen to be holy and without blame. You are chosen to be adopted as sons. Now, the next one is, you are chosen, uh, verse 5 says, Jesus Christ, um, by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. You are chosen to give him pleasure. You are chosen a good according to the good pleasure of his will. He chooses you because that makes him happy. He chooses you because that pleases God. Amen. Therefore, you must believe that you are chosen. The fact that you are here, the fact that things um, happened to you, uh, that you are here means that you are chosen and uh, that makes him happy. God delights in that. The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. You believe, you have faith that you are chosen and that is why you are here. And this is the sovereign will of God. It's the sovereign will of God. If you go and study Romans 9, it speaks about how Rebecca conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac. And it says there that the purpose of God according to election may stand. And then it says in Romans 9, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. Now, 
understand who we see as God. Because there's a lot of false teachings out there at the moment, like open theism. You can go and study. We will discuss that at our apostolic table one of the days. Open theism means that uh, God doesn't know the future. He doesn't know who he's going to choose. And that comes against the omniscience of God. We recognize in this ministry that God is omnipotent, all-powerful. He's omniscient, all-knowing. And he is omnipresent, which means he is present everywhere at the same time. Now, it's God's sovereign right. You know, people are talking today about human rights. If you look at the Bella Bill, it's shocking. It's all about the rights of the children. And everybody forget about God's rights. You know what God's right is? God's right as creator. He has the right to cause you to not to wake up in the morning. Every morning that you wake up and you breathe again means that God has his hand on you. Amen. He created you and he can give and he can take away. It is his right. He may choose or reject anyone purely for his pleasure. When he made this vessel, uh, the pot uh, in his pottery, he could choose which clay he likes the most. And it is his sovereign right. The church needs to come back to the sovereignty of God. The church needs to begin to understand again that he is almighty, sovereign God. And God chose you for his good pleasure and the good pleasure of his mysterious will is his purpose. Let me say it again. The good pleasure of his mysterious will is his purpose. That's why Jesus said, I must do, um, the, I must finish the work. I must do the will of my father. Even Paul, Paul says, I must finish. I must do the will of the father. So some people say this is foolish. Some people say it's foolish that God um, is sovereign and he chooses according to his pleasure. But the Bible says in 1 Corinthians that God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen and the things which are not to bring nothing to nothing the things that are. Do you know what that scripture means? It means God chose you while you were weak to put the world to shame. God chose you because you were weak. God chose you because you were despised to make something out of nothing. And this should humble us. The fact that we are chosen, the fact that we are here in Christ, the fact that we've received all this wonderful revelation, how he favors us because he took nothing and he made something out of it. Amen. God had a purpose with you. Tell your partner that you're sitting next to or whoever it is, God has chosen you. He's got a purpose with you. And if there's no one next to you, say, thank you, Lord. You have chosen me. You have a purpose for me. Second Timothy 1 verse 9 um, says that he saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus. So you were chosen according to his purpose, not your plan, not your strategies, not your purpose. Because today there is a false gospel, which is a narcissistic gospel. It's a gospel of self-actualization. It's a gospel of self-realization. It's all about the purposeful life, the purposeful church. It's all about my purpose instead of his purpose. We've got to find out what is the purpose of God. I'm waiting for someone to write a book called The Purposeful God instead of The Purposeful Life or The Purposeful Church. What about The Purposeful God? God had a purpose. And you know what? You are his choice people. You are his choice people. The Bible says in Romans 8 that all things work together for good to them that love God, 
to them who are called according to his purpose and that for whom he did foreknow, he also predestined. Now, what did he foreknow you for? What did he choose you for? What did you, what did he predestinate you for? He predestined you to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That is the divine purpose. That is the purpose that God has chosen you. For what? Not for you just to exist. Not for you just to live there with your family, going to work, having a happy life. His purpose is for us to be conformed to the image of his son. That means that you have access to the father as a son. That means that you have the same image as Christ. That means that he becomes the example for you. He becomes the pattern son that you would walk just as he has walked. You will follow in his footsteps. That's why Jesus says, follow in my footsteps. Walk as I have walked. So that you would have the same intellectual image as him, the same mind as Christ, so that you will have the same moral likeness as Christ, that you will have the same righteousness, the same moral likeness, that you would have the same values as him, that you would have the same authority as Christ. Amen. That you would have the same glory as Christ, even the same spirit as him. That is what you have been called for and chosen for, that you would conform to the image of his son, that you would have the same self-control as him when the devil appeared to him. And Jesus said, it was written. He exercised restraint. He exercised self-control, that you would overcome just like him. That's why, that's why Jesus says, if you overcome, you will be seated uh, with me, even as I have overcome and is seated with my father in heaven. So you would have, you would be an overcomer that you would be led by the spirit for as many as are led by the spirit of God. These are the sons of God, that you would have a heritage and inheritance because we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. That you would be intimate with the father, as Jesus said, Abba, father, he enjoyed this intimate relationship with the father. That you would be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. And for you to attain perfection, for you to attain holiness means that you go through a series of chastisement. He chastises you because he loves you, because you're a son. And that's what you are purpose for. That is what you were chosen for, that you would be conformed to the image of his son. That's why the Bible says, as he is, so are we in this world. So we would be accurate representatives, conformed to the image of Christ. He did not choose us because of our faith. He did not choose us because of our worthiness. He did not choose us because we, because of our morality, because we are holy, because we keep the law. He didn't choose us because of anything good in us. The Bible says all have sinned. And do you know what is God's sovereign right? God is not obligated to save anyone. There's a lot of proud folk in the church right now who have the sense of self-entitlement. Narcissistic Christians, they think they, they are entitled to be saved. No, God is not obligated to save you. Just because you are growing up in a Christian family, all those who are children and with your family right now, just because your mother is a believer, just before, because your father is a Christian, doesn't mean God is obligated to save you. You need to have your own relationship with the Lord. You need to grow up in faith and you need to begin to, to be uh, operating from Christ. God is not obligated to save anyone. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. All of us deserve death, but he chose you for the pleasure of his purpose.
because of his purpose. The Bible says in Ephesians um, that he predestinated us and to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace. Amen? To the praise of the glory of his grace. So you are chosen to be conformed to Christ, to become like him, to have his image, the same image as Christ. And remember, Jesus was 100% God and 100% man. He had a dual nature. Now, when we say dual nature, we're not saying that you're schizophrenic. There's some stupid people coming up on social media and they say, no, no, you can't have two natures because that makes you schizophrenic. And these are people who are not medical experts. So don't uh, converse with people like that. They are stupid because they want to take, they want to present themselves as medical experts. Schizophrenia is, is a medical condition. And uh, schizophrenia, you cannot be in two minds at the same time. Okay? You cannot be in two minds at the same time. Like the prodigal son who was there at the uh, in the pigsty, he came to himself. He, he had some signs of schizophrenia, okay? And we recognize that bipolar and schizophrenia is a medical condition and you can still live a normal life if you um, are obedient to medical instructions. Take medication and so on. Um, you are not mad. You're not mental, okay? We don't look down on people who have medical uh, a medical condition but that's not what we are talking about when we're saying that you have two natures it means that you are you have the image of christ because as he is so are we jesus was 100 percent man and 100 percent god you got this nature you got human flesh because think about it if you were only spirit then you wouldn't die the very fact that you are able to die means that you have two natures. You still have the, the nature, the fleshly nature. The fact that you are aging, aging is a disease. It's because we've got a sinful nature. The Bible calls this flesh corrupt. And we will only be changed when Jesus returns. Amen. Then that uh, final um uh nature of ours that that final that 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 thing that we don't like will be removed and you will receive a glorified body a sinless sinless body does this give us a license to sin does it give us a license to do what we want to do no it doesn't give us a license to go and live a life full of sin you are called you are chosen that you should be holy and blameless so as you're growing in Christ, you become a mature son of God. So he accepted us by grace. Election is a grace transaction. Let's go back to our text, Ephesians 1 verse 6. Ephesians 1 verse 6. To the praise of the glory of his grace. To the praise of the glory of his grace. You were chosen in him. You were chosen um, before the foundations of the earth that you should be holy and blameless. You were chosen in love. You were chosen to be conformed to the image of Christ. And you were chosen to the praise of the glory of his grace. Election is a grace transaction and that grace i'm talking about is unmerited favor there's two kinds of grace there's salvation grace and there is dominion grace i'm not talking about dominion grace now okay we're talking about free grace salvation grace election is a grace transaction the bible says in second timothy who has saved us and called us with a holy calling not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus. 
So he accepted those he chose by grace because of unmerited favor, not because of anything that you have done. Not even a sinner's prayer can save you. It is only grace, by grace alone, through faith alone. Ephesians 2 says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. I want all of you, all the children who are present here today, to memorize that scripture. And next time we have this meeting, we will have some of the children uh, telling us the scriptures that they have memorized. Memorize a few of these scriptures that says that we are chosen. By grace, you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Hebrews 10 verse 14 says, For by one offering he perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Christ perfected the elect through the atonement. That offering was his blood. It says one offering. It was the offering of blood. Through his blood on the cross, he perfected those who are chosen. You are the elect of God. You are the chosen. And Christ perfected you through the atonement. And this is a complete atonement. Uh, sometime down the line, we'll speak about this atonement, how it's a limited atonement. It's a complete atonement. He redeemed us. He forgave us of all sin and he justified us. He sanctified the elect. The sanctified he spoke about are the chosen company, the elect. The atonement is sufficient only for the elect. Jesus didn't die for those who are not chosen. He died for those who are chosen. His atonement is sufficient for the elect only. The elect are chosen and enabled in conviction and faith. So you may ask, oh, how do I know who's chosen? Those who are convicted. The Bible says many are called, but few are chosen. What does that mean? Many are called. But few. Why would God call many and choose a few? No, they are called because th who are calling them? As preachers go out and minister and share the gospel, preach the gospel all over the world, they are calling people. You, they are called. You may be called today. You may receive this invite. You are called to this meeting. But few are chosen. If you are truly regenerated in your spirit, then you are chosen. Amen. So the atonement are only for those who are chosen. Those who are called uh, but not chosen, they will come, they will fall off. They will fall off. That's why a lot of people um, come into the church and then you see suddenly they, they go back to Hinduism. They came, but they were not chosen. Okay. Uh, we cannot boast of our salvation. I need you to understand there's nothing that we can boast of. We cannot boast because we love Jesus. We cannot boast because we are saved. Um, God sovereignly left others out to pursue their own inclinations. God chose some. And those who are chosen are undeserving Let's just think about that for a moment. We are chosen. We did not deserve to be here. This should humble us today. This should humble us. This should make us love him more that we did not deserve to be here. We did not deserve to be chosen. God chooses some to display his love, mercy, and kindness. And those who are chosen still have to hear and believe the gospel and be saved. And that is why everyone have to hear the gospel, but not everyone will be saved. You know that not everyone will be saved. Many are called, but few are chosen. Now, the election is based on the promise. 
So, so far we spoke about, let's just recap the things that I said. You are chosen in him. You are chosen to be holy and without blame. You are chosen in love. He foreknew you. You are chosen to be adopted as a son, to be part of his family. You are chosen for the pleasure of his good will, that you would be conformed to become a son of God. That's his will, that you would represent him, that you will be like him. You are chosen to the praise of the glory of his grace. It's a grace transaction. And then lastly, the election is based on the promise. God made a promise. God swore to himself. He made a promise. And the next time that we come together, we will deal with that because that's a long portion. Romans 9, we will focus on Romans 9 that this promise, this promise was not to the geographical Israel. The Jews believe that they are the chosen uh, nation, that they are the chosen people of God. But I need you to understand that that was before the cross. After the cross, the Bible speaks in Revelation about this church that is descending out of God manifesting on the earth, Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem. The Bible says the old Jerusalem, the, the geographical Jerusalem, this Jerusalem that is there in Israel is a liken to Hagar. It is the slave woman. But there's another Jerusalem that's born of above. Jerusalem that is coming down out of God, manifesting on the earth that is a spiritual jerusalem a lot of people are now going back to jewish teachings a lot of people are now suddenly becoming jews i have relatives who are now suddenly becoming jews they want to blow the chauffeur they want to uh, celebrate all the feasts and uh, hopefully still this year or the beginning of next year, I'm going to speak about the seven feasts of God, how the feasts have been um, uh, fulfilled in Christ. Because a lot of people are now uh, having all this madness. They want to celebrate the feasts. People want to keep the Sabbath day. They think now we are the chosen nation. No, there's a lot of confusion. People don't understand how. The geographical location, Jerusalem, became a spiritual position. The geographical location called Jerusalem became a spiritual position. So now we are the churches coming down out of God. You are the Jews of God. You're not circumcised in the flesh. You're circumcised in the heart. It's called the spiritual circumcision. Amen. And so. Uh, just like Israel was called to be adopted and part of the family of God, and they had the glory, the cloud of fire, they had covenants, they had the law, they had the tabernacle of service, they had promises, um, they had their fathers, uh, right? All of that, we are now following in the spirit. You adopted to be part of the family of God. You are walking in the same glory that Christ has. You have the new covenant with new promises, which are better than the old covenant and the old promises. You are fulfilled in Christ. Promises are fulfilled in Christ. And so Christ is incarnated in us. Um, Christ becomes flesh in us. So we are going to speak about that the next time that we come together. But I want you just to understand that you are a chosen generation. You are here because you are handpicked. You are here because God loves you. Amen. So I hope that you um, took note of this this morning. Um, Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Grace has been given to build and perfect and to equip us for service in ways that reflect the fullness.